Well, there's so many out. opportunities here. If you're a little bit entrepreneurial and have a rough idea of what you want to do, they need just about everything here. So this is truly the land of opportunity. I, and I think you mentioned maybe something like Singapore in future. I think it's very actually, yeah, I'm very bullish on on the direction of the country, and it's it's so exciting and pleasing to be living somewhere where we're on a positive trajectory <laughs> rather than in Australia and the US and Europe where things are just getting worse. Um, so it's a great place to be. We are live again here from Bitcoin Beach, and today we have Owen from Beef Back Better with us. He is going to share where you can get the best beef in El Salvador for sure, maybe in Central America. I don't know. Let's let's find out a, a little bit of his story and how he came to be a beef purveyor here in El Salvador. So welcome, Owen. Thanks for having me on. And you're not originally from here, uh, I'm assuming, no, from your accent? Uh, no, from Australia. Uh, been living here for five months, or almost six months now. So you are uh, one one of the Australian refugees that are trying to escape the uh, nanny state there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I came for a visit last year, just as soon as they allowed us out of the country, because uh, the borders were closed for I think for two years. Was it two years that they were? Yeah, closed? I mean, you could get a special exemption if I really tried. I could have got someone to, but. I kind of knuckled down there and actually bought a little farm and, and did some beef cattle farming myself during lockdown times in Australia. But then, uh, yeah, uh, as soon as I was allowed out, I came for a visit here and spent four weeks here. And then um, as soon as I got back to Australia, I realized, I yeah, I just didn't feel like I wanted to stay there. So then it was the start of a six month process of packing everything up, selling everything and, and moving over here. So was it mainly you were wanted to leave Australia because of what transpired during the COVID lockdowns or were you already thinking that it was time to get out or were you just kind of restless or what was it that kind of made you think that it's time to leave? I was already planning on leaving Australia before the COVID stuff. Um, I've never lived abroad before and I had some opportunities. That was in Thailand I was going to move to. And right when I was about to move, that's when all of the madness started. So I ended up staying. Um, I'm not sure whether that was the right decision or not, but at the time that seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, so yeah, I was al I already wanted to get out. I was already um, aware of the opportunities that existed sort of elsewhere. And Australia had been getting worse and worse in terms of the nanny state, the cost of living, the rules and regulations, the, yeah, the, all of the sort of woke mentality that was already all happening for a long time. Um, but then in, yeah, and then in that couple of years while borders were closed and while I actually had a great couple of years, <laughs> I had one of the best couple of years of my life because I bought a little farm and I moved away from the big towns and cities and, um, and that was good. However, uh, and then of course El Salvador became, um, sort of on my, on my radar and, and then, yeah, was seemed like the place to be. Did the announcement of them adopting Bitcoin, is that what put it on your radar? Had you been to El Salvador before or had thought never about been, it before? Didn't, I, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't even know where it was. Uh, never been to the Americas before. Traveled a lot, but never to this side of, of, the, of the world. So, um, yeah, I knew about Bitcoin Beach already. And then I heard about the announcement of it being legal tender and I was pretty excited about that. And that's when I started looking in detail and watching reading and watching YouTube uh, channels, you know, every day for, for a long time and was really keen to get here and look around. And so you made a trip here initially just for a few weeks or? Yeah, I had three weeks in El Zante okay. last year, almost a year ago now. And, uh, and one week in, the, in San Salvador and realized it was fine, like, uh, the people were lovely and and it was safe and you could get everything you needed um i still wasn't totally sold on i didn't really decide there wasn't a day when i decided 
to move here, but I that yeah, that was sort of in motion and then um there was definitely this sinking feeling when I arrived back into Australia after that trip. But I was trying to correct for if that was just because I was in holiday mode and having some adventure after two years of no adventure yeah. <laughs> in Australia. Um, and it was not super clear, but um, but now that I'm here, it's I'm really happy. <laughs> when you came back for the second time, was it with the plan to move here yeah, or was I'd, it? Everything was okay. sold, everything was done. Yeah. You, you burned the boats and... Uh, Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm still trying to maintain my... Uh, good standing with with the authorities in Australia and so on, but uh, so that they might let me back in one day should I need to. But no, I sold the farm and and rehomed the animals and and sold all all of the all of my possessions basically and, okay. and got on a plane just with a couple of suitcases. And those suitcases were mostly full of motorcycle gear. They weren't even like other stuff. It was just because I, <laughs> I I like to ride uh, dirt bikes as well, and and that was something that. I really wanted to do here because I did a little bit and the terrain here is amazing. You can ride up a volcano. Yeah. Like you don't do you can't do that in Australia. So that was something that I held on to and looked forward to. And I've been doing a lot of that here too. You'll have to uh ask ask Andy where to, to go around here. Andy Andy loves to, to ride bikes. Andy's our, our sound guy there in the back that makes this uh thing sound so good. So. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Uh so have you been riding here at all? Yeah. Or, a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So and that's actually been amazing because that's that's how I meet most of the locals that I meet. Um, otherwise, it might be easy to fall into just the next pat yeah. scene. Um, but I ride only with locals. Okay. Um, a lot of them. You have you read, ridden with Alex at all? That owns yeah. the hotel yeah, over here. All the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice, nice, <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We're good riding buddies, so okay. we ride in the hills through here, and I've ridden all around the country already, and. Um, and, and I know tough. Chimbera loves to ride Chimbera's too. Chimbera's riding as well. Yeah. yeah, we've ridden together. Okay. It's um, it's hot and it's hard. It's the, the the riding mostly they do here is called hard enduro, and it's really a crazy sport. Really, yeah. it's very rough terrain and it's very hot. <laughs> you should. I think you're better off walking. But, uh, but anyway, we we enjoy it. So and yeah, I end up I've met dozens of guys, lo local guys, and that's really great when we go away for a whole day and they're all speaking Spanish and that helps me learn and um and it's great to get there their aspect on things their point of view on things on where the country's going yeah. it's super interesting because they're mostly they're wealthy enough to own good motorcycles and to have time to do recreation so which, which here would be upper middle class to the wealthy i mean that's exactly uh, yeah. exactly so um so they're all running businesses uh hotels or restaurants or construction or or um coffee or whatever and it's very interesting to talk to them about doing business here and how things have changed i'm always asking people about because it's hard to until you're here, it's very hard to understand what things are actually like and and to imagine what it was like before Bekele and uh, yeah, it's but so getting some first hand accounts I, I do whenever I can. I'm curious as to I'm sure you know there's different opinions amongst them, but what are some things that have kind of stood out to you? Because a lot of times the people in the, the wealthier class are the ones that are a little less uh, excited about Bukele. So just kind of curious in general if you found that or you think the business owners are, are realizing the benefits that are, have come into the economy or what's the general sense? Uh, yeah, it's a mix. It is a mix. Um, um, and you, and I agree. It is the case that generally it's the more wealthy, I would say even more wealthy than most of the guys I'm talking about that are really quite anti Bekele and quite anti Bitcoin. And a lot of them had pretty comfortable little fiefdoms before exactly. this. So I think, for them, any change is bad. They exactly. see things being shaken up. I think a lot of them will realize in the long run, they actually benefit hugely from it. But right now, they're just afraid things are going to change and they're going to lose whatever monopolies they have or sweet deals I think you're exactly have. right. Yeah, the status quo has been good yeah. for them. And they're nervous about change because of that. And that's understandable. Um, and understanding how how Bitcoin might help is, is difficult. That doesn't happen overnight. So so there are the, there, there are those people, but most of the i mean yeah there's so many amazing stories um some of the towns we ride to on the motorcycles you couldn't go to three years ago and some of the like this is first-hand account from local guys so so i trust what they're telling me um some of the rural areas we ride to further up in the hills up near honduras and so on you you could not go there you might get shot that's that's what they say you might get shot if you go there even villages just up here i don't know if you're aware of that like not yeah. too far from chill to yeah. like, you just couldn't go there three years ago if you went from there you might get shot no where we bought our property i wouldn't have bought it three years ago the the, the place we bought up in the hills with the coffee farm it a few years ago it was 
kind of a no go zone. Yeah. So all of them agree that it's fantastic that we can all go right. We, everyone can go anywhere in the country now freely and safely. Um, some of them, are, and I also respect this uh, point of view. Some of them are wary of Bekele and wary of how popular he is because they have a very sensible distrust of government and their right to distrust government, yeah. including the Bekele government, in my opinion. Um, so it's a very sensible opinion. They, some of them are worried about how the younger generation really worship Bekele, and that's that's a fair point of view. Um, some of them are ske- skeptical that and think that he will just one day end up in jail like like previous presidents have for the same thing for embezzling money. They they don't they don't trust that he's going to be any different, and that's a um, that's a fair enough point of view. But generally, yeah, I mean the difference. I heard from a, a friend who's a, a, a coffee, in the coffee business, and he has several coffee farm suppliers, and he told me the other day that every fifteen days the, the, a boy would come from the gangs and collect the money and. And it was just the way of life. It was just how they lived. But also at, at the processing facility, they were on the border of two different gang areas. And sometimes there would be gunfights in front of the processing facility. So it was very disruptive for their business. And it was an additional cost to the business. And so, yeah, they, they're very happy um, with, with it. They, they don't maybe understand the, benefit, the potential benefits of Bitcoin. Um, but broadly, among those guys, there's support. And among the taxi drivers and the business, the people that you meet, that yes, he's, they're very happy with the fact that they can get out safely and have a good time and everyone's doing it. Everyone's partying here now. It's yeah. a great a great vibe here at the moment. And entrepreneurs are starting businesses and uh, you can get, you can walk around freely at night. And so everyone's having a good time and, and it makes sense that he's got such, such a high level of support. Well, there's a sense of excitement and, and that anything's possible. Which was definitely not the case, you know, even a couple of years ago. So it's been pretty remarkable. And I've been here for almost 20 years. And to see that change right. recently has been sometimes I'm still like, is this really for real? Or so it's, yeah, it's been really remarkable. Yeah. The, you said they're still trying to figure out Bitcoin or they're not sure of the benefits of it or what. Do you feel like they have any interest or is it kind of like, eh, that's good for you? Uh, but- it's just, it just varies. You can't generalize yeah. this every um, end of the spectrum. So yeah. generally, I, I would say most people have some interest and are quite open to learning about it. Um, um, some are just like, oh, no, just not interested. Just, no, it's too hard. I don't like... And they're, the, <laughs> I don't mean to be critical, they're, they're often probably the people who are still standing in queue at the bank to pay their bills. It's like, you don't actually have to do that anymore in El Salvador. You can use this Chivo wallet and you can just actually pay your bills like online now because yeah. um, Chivo wallet has banking integration with every bank here as an example. Um, so there's just that resistance to new things, which is understandable, it's difficult. Um, generally fairly open to it. Um, but not really understanding how beneficial it might be. So that's something I often say, I will say it might be very important in the future. Like we're not sure, but it might actually be very important in the future <laughs> for El Salvador. And they're sort of, oh, okay, they might yeah. not have thought of that. Yeah. Interesting. I, I'm really interested in how in in how they started using the dollar here. I had assumed that that the colonies must have gone into hyperinflation, but apparently they didn't. I don't know if you know how the history of that, I, I don't only know a little bit, but Apparently, it didn't ever go into hyperinflation, and it was a it was a decision by the government to go to the U.S. dollar to prevent future money printing. I think excesses. It, there had been historically there had been some times of hyperinflation, but that was not in the time frame where they actually decided to dollarize. But part of it was they had a peg to the dollar. I think for. A at least a decade prior to the dollarization, huh. that 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 was how they prevented the hyperinflation from happening again. They had a, a an official peg to the dollar, and I think the decision to go from being pegged to actually just using the dollar was they were still paying a, a differential in the markets to to borrow money because there was still this currency risk that maybe they could decide to devalue their currency in the future. And so I think it was thought of, hey, this is a way for us to access cheaper money, you know, cheaper interest rates. 
And I think that's why the, the wealthy benefited much more from the dollarization where kind of the poor average people, there was a sense that it actually made things in their life more expensive. And I think part of that from what I heard was a lot of businesses just rounded up when they made that conversion. And so if you're just buying things once a week and they round your bill from, you know, $100 to 101, it's not that big of a deal. But for the people that are buying their food daily, they were seeing this round up from, you know, 15 cents to a quarter. And so for them, it felt like it was a huge, you know, yeah, inflationary. Maybe. I'd heard that as well, yeah. that, it, that there was an increase in costs uh, when they went to the dollar and that there's, and some people worry about an increase in costs happening now because of going to Bitcoin, um, which I don't think has any basis and. I actually hadn't thought of that. It could have, could be as simple as the rounding issue and the de the denominations, because um, that sort of happens in um, in Costa Rica where they're using two currencies always, uh, their local uh, one and and the US dollar, and and you can pay with both at the same time, or you can pay with US dollars and get local change, and always they're just rounding yeah. to the most convenient denomination which is and probably in their favor most of the time always too. in their favor yeah it's <laughs> like it's about 2000 colonists in costa rica they're called colonists i think so i think yeah. so yeah um where yeah so maybe that's all it was interesting uh, uh, you mentioned the the cost of borrowing i i don't understand how it works so interest rates borrowing rates here are quite high i don't understand why the local I, banks don't just i think it was even more before because you have El Salvador is considered higher risk than the U.S., so you're mm. going to pay in general a higher rate. But there was also before a sense that they could default on the currency. And so mm. when they would go to the market and try to sell in the local currency, they baked this in. OK, you're going to have to pay us extra because we don't know if you're going to devalue in the future. Yep. And so for them, it was like, hey, we're pegged to the dollar anyways. Why not just, you know, completely convert? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't understand the mechanics of why. The, some people say that uh, El Salvador has been restricted in its in its money creation um, because of being on using the US dollar. But <clears throat> I don't understand if there's the degree of regulatory oversight or, or cooperation between the international banks and the local banks because the local banks that are US dollar denominated they can still just create credit like any any euro dollar bank right so uh, anyway i don't yeah. understand I've... they can still create credit but the government itself can't just print money i think that's what people are referring to where you know you see other places like mm. argentina the government just prints extra money to pay their bills and so i think it's more of the the money can't be created on the government end yeah. of things so maybe some of those which i think well, is a positive but yeah. some people think no that's holding it back, it's better for the government to inject more money into the system. They don't realize what that leads to, so. Yeah, maybe it meant that there was a bit more of a uh, benefit for the for the wealthier families, for the older money, where they were they were the bank, like some yeah. of those guys are the bankers um, and friends with the bankers, and maybe they were able to- Benefit more from that. Issue, you know, un unrestrained credit to one another, but, but the government wasn't, and maybe that was good. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting to think about and to about Bitcoin succeeding. And I think this is a great place to be partly because it already has the US dollar and now it also has Bitcoin. For me, it's a great place to be because it's got the strongest crappy fiat currency and, and Bitcoin. Yeah. But then another argument is that you may be better off to be in a country that has uh, a weak currency that they print uh, at will when hyper Bitcoinization happens because things will get more cheaply more quickly, but it's yeah. I think maybe in the short term, but I think longer term, you want to be in a place where the currency is not collapsing. So yeah, a smooth transition. A of, yeah. a, my, a smooth transition could happen here because yeah. the infrastructure is in place to for everyone to just gradually start using Bitcoin. So yeah, I think it's the place to be. I definitely want to mm. focus on uh, on the beef aspect, but before we get to that. Just a lot of the people that, that watch the show or are listening, they're thinking about moving to El Salvador. That's uh, one of their motivations for, for checking in with us every week. What has been your positive experiences? What have been your negative experiences? What would you recommend to people who are thinking about that, hey, maybe this is something you haven't considered or this is a reason you need to do it now? Just kind of your general sense of expat life here. Yeah, sure. Um so firstly it's very safe like we all keep saying but everyone still has a, a perception that it's unsafe um, i haven't had one issue i've not even had an argument i've never felt unsafe 
Uh, when I was first living in the city, I wouldn't go out on my own at night. And I laugh at that now. It is just, it's completely safe here. Um, so that's, uh, even for, for petty theft and stuff, there's not even any of that that I've seen. I, yeah, I, I think there's less than in places like Costa Rica. Oh, way less. Yeah. Costa Rica, it's every day. And in, and I was told by a local, because I was there recently for Costa Rica, uh, uh, well, he was an expat, but he lived there for 17 years. And he said that he has things stolen all the time and the police do nothing. And I'm just thinking, wow, that's not a good recipe for, um, and they sort of, they don't like expats as much there as well. So they're happy to try to, I got ripped off and we had something stolen from the Airbnb and there are signs up everywhere. Don't leave anything in your car because cars get broken into every day. And none of that happens here. It's so safe in terms of um, theft. There's basically no theft. Even with the motorcycles, we leave them out. There's ten thousand dollar motorcycles. You just leave them out overnight at the hotel, and nobody takes them. It's amazing to me because in Australia they'd be stolen straight away. <laughs> so um, it's very safe. Um, the people are incredibly friendly. They love foreigners. They haven't had many foreigners like visiting for for decades. So uh, they're interested in in us and they want to help. So that's really nice. Um, so I'd recommend coming and having a look first. I know plenty of people who just came without having a look first and they're still here. So that, Which, that seems crazy to me. I'm more of a planner, but yeah, they're like, no, we were certain that's where we were going to wind up. And so, yeah, I know. Yeah. Plenty that didn't do it. Didn't do a practice run. Like I did that practice run and was here for a month and, and realized I could get everything I needed. I could get around easily and it was perfectly safe and it was going to be difficult. Like being, living abroad is difficult and living in a, you know, it was really basically a war-torn country. It's very much uh, in ways, you know, it's, it's, it's a third world country that even that's old terminology. But, but at the same time in the city, there's all the conveniences you need and Ubers are cheap and there are great restaurants and there are great shopping malls and there's all of that as well. So I would say come over here and stay in San Salvador and also get down for a visit to El Zonte and um, uh, yeah, just rent it and even stay for a month or two if you can and just rent an Airbnb and try to understand what it's like living here. And, and uh, there, there are some challenges. Um, what, what would you say was like the biggest negative or the biggest challenge that, that you've faced? Well, the language barrier for me would have to, yeah, is the biggest thing. Yeah. But um, in the tourist towns and down in El Zonte now, you can get away with speaking English. Um, but at least to learn a little bit of Spanish before you come will will make things a lot easier for you. Um, but I haven't had too many challenges really. It's been it hasn't been difficult. Yeah. And how would you find the costs in living in El Salvador versus Australia? I think a lot of people are expected to be cheaper than it is. But how would you? How is it compared to to life in El Sa or in Australia? Yeah, it's a lot cheaper than Australia, but it's not as cheap as somewhere like Thailand. So a lot of Australians visit Thailand or Bali. And uh, it's nowhere near as cheap as Thailand, especially rent. Um, rent and electricity are expensive. Uh, still much cheaper than Australia. I, most things are still like half or less the price, but some things are more expensive, like the motorcycles, motorcycles. that I like, unfortunately. Um, so you can live cheaply, but if you want to have relative comfort, you're still going to be paying $1,000 US a month for a rental if you want to be in in comfort that you're familiar with i mean you can rent a place for 200 dollars a month yeah. but it's it's going to be pretty basic um so but other costs are so much lower than in australia like um like registering a car and anything to do with the government is like one tenth the price uh, government fees are very yeah. low very low um, and really no pro i mean I, I don't think you own anything yet but there's really no property taxes in the country either which is a Huge expense for most people that are homeowners or property owners. So. Yeah, I didn't ever get hit with property tax in Australia because I didn't own enough, I guess. But I do hear complaints about it from Australians who maybe have more than one property or more than a value or it's in a company or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, Australia, the cost of living in Australia is very high. It's very bad. Um, you can't go out the door without, without uh, you know, just getting hit with all these, all these fees, mostly government fees. Um, so it's a lot cheaper here, but it's nowhere near as cheap as Thailand. So keep that in mind. Um, you can still spend $30 for a meal. That's US dollars if you want to. Uh, but you can also get pupusas for $2. Yeah. So you, similar to, to other developing countries, you can live cheaply. But if you want to live comfortably, it's um, you, you're still going to be um, 
needing to earn a lot more than the average local if you want to have nice accommodations and so on. Um, in Costa Rica recently, for instance, it's so much more expensive there. Uh, we had Compared to here? Compared to here, yeah. Okay. Costa Rica is much more expensive, but Guatemala is cheaper. So um, Costa Rica, we had two coffees and a large bottle of soda water. It was $18. It was like being in LA or something. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. <laughs> so it's not like that here, uh, but it's also not super cheap like yeah. Thailand. I don't want to get too far off in the weeds, but uh, I'm curious, how was, uh, was it called Nostra Rica? What was that with the conference? Yeah, there? Nostra Rica. So I had wanted to check out, I haven't traveled much in, in Latin America Latin America at all. And I heard a lot about Bitcoin jungle in mm -hmm. Costa Rica down in Uvita and uh, what some of the guys from there came to, well, yeah, most of the guys came to uh, adopting Bitcoin yeah, here in yeah, November. Yeah. I met so them I met some of them yeah, and heard what they were doing and it sounded great. So I was keen to have an excuse to go and check out Bitcoin jungle and then happened to be I'm really glad. I saw, it was only a couple of months that Nostra Rica started popping, or Nostra started popping up, and everyone on Twi Bitcoin Twitter was sort of starting to play with Nostra. And um, I'm still not on it yet. It's on. It's on my list, but I'm like, so you do I really need, want to be on another platform? So it's. Uh, yeah, I still use Twitter more. Okay, but um, I found if you just have one buddy and you both decide that you're going to sign up and you just apply yourself for half an hour. And help each other out. You work out how to do it. Just getting your getting your NPUB and and uh, choosing which uh, app or or which which website uh, to use, um, and then uh, yeah, just working out how it works. But um, Nostra Rica was great, and it was yeah. So it was an, it's an excuse to just to check out Bitcoin Jungle while there's going to be lots of Bitcoiners there. So I decided to go along. It's a short flight uh, from here. And stayed for how, a week. how big of a conference was it? There were, apparently there were 300 tickets sold. I think there were only about 200 and 250 people okay. there. But were was, they mostly Bitcoiners? Or? Yeah. Okay. And it was all free, all paid for by Jack Dorsey. Apparently, okay. even the food, which was excellent. Nice. This was, and we, it started at 7 a.m. yoga, and then it was very chilled. I've never been to a conference like it. It was it was really fun. It was really nice. And yeah, lots of Bitcoiners, uh, not many shitcoiners. Um, Jack Dorsey was there and he spoke about, um, he, se he really seemed to genuinely feel bad about how, how Twitter turned out in terms of the censorship and how excited it was about Nostra because it's sort of inherently censorship resistant. So it's notes and other stuff transmitted by Relays. Um, maybe you list, some of the listeners have heard about Mastodon. It has some improvements over Mastodon because uh, you can't block whole instances. It's not sort of separate instances it's just run a relay and you can access and and you can access everyone uh, you can still block individual people if you want but you can't instances can't block each other and so it has a lot of parallels with bitcoin and its censorship resistance and its uh decentralization um and it's still clunky very clunky it's really early days but it looks really promising um it's no algo so it's it's just chronological so that the well, the application of Nostra at the moment is mostly as a social media app, alternative to Twitter. But really, it could be used for anything. Yeah. Nostra could be the whole internet, a whole, an entire decentralized. Every protocol could be built on Nostra, so it's pretty exciting. Mm. Were there very many of the Bitcoiners from El Salvador that went down? There or? were a good contingent of, okay. of Salvadorians. Yeah, yeah, maybe a dozen or so. Okay. And um, and yeah, of course, the, one of the things they've implemented in Nostra early on is that you can send Bitcoin by lightning to anyone. So you can, instead of liking a, a tweet, a uh, whatever, a note, instead of liking a note, you can send some some Satoshis and they, they receive them directly. So that's quite cool. Yeah, I hear everybody talking about zapping, zapping their Satoshis around. So yeah. I'm like, all right, I got to I got to sit down and just get on it and at least uh, understand it. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's worth a look. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about beef. Uh, it's funny that you're in this business because when I moved to El Salvador, that was one of my biggest complaints about the country is the beef was horrible. I mean, you could get decent beef, but it was, you know, like $22 a pound for a, you know, a decent steak at Price Mart imported from the U S and, you know, a lot of the cuts, they cut things differently here. So I would go and buy something. I thought, oh, this looks like a good steak. And I would throw it on the, the grill and grill it. And then I would try to cut it. And it would literally like could not cut it. It mm. was like <laughs> just rubber. So yeah. we just really stopped eating beef for, for quite a while because it was just horrible or incredibly expensive. Uh, more recently, 
there seems to be a lot of decent beef coming in, or at least from my perspective, decent coming in from Nicaragua um, at, at decent prices. Um, so I'm curious as to what you saw when you came in, why you decided to get into the beef business and what you guys are doing differently. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I had a similar experience. So I eat mostly steak and eggs. That's mostly my diet. Um, when I came over last year in May, I was staying with some guys that had just been at, I don't know if you've heard of Paul Saladino. He's one of these carnivore doctors. He's in Costa Rica. He has this animal the based sounds familiar. Animal based gathering. And okay. my friends had been there at a retreat and I said, you're going to meet a lot of Bitcoiners there. And sure enough, there were a bunch of Bitcoiners at the, at the carnival retreat. <clears throat> and so some of them came back and we had a week together here. And, um, so we were buying a lot of what we thought was sort of the, the premium beef here, the premium beef at the supermarket. Uh, and they look like good cuts, like good, good juicy ribeyes and so on. But, and the couple of the guys I was with actually were only eating raw beef. So they're full on carnivores, wow. these guys. So they sit down and just eat a raw steak. And actually it's not that bad. Like, raw beef's quite nice, but, um, I usually cook mine a little bit. Um, and they were starting to notice that it tastes funny. It was making them feel sick, feel sick. And, um, I then tried some without putting any salt on and it's really salty. I'm like, oh, this is, in, it's like ham. It's in brine. This is obviously in brine. And I didn't understand what, like I've never come across that in Australia that they would put any additives in in, in a steak. Like it's just usually a packaged yeah. steak, right? So, and yeah, a lot of that beef. So I started looking into it and just trying to find a good steak during that visit and didn't succeed. And so one of the things I wanted to do when I came back was maybe uh if i at least find some good steaks for myself and maybe then also make a business out of it because i thought there was a uh a potential opportunity there because as you say it's all imported that but almost all of the beef some of the beef in the supermarket is local um but almost all of it's imported mostly from nicaragua a lot of it's from feedlots or um, CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations um so grain fed and lots of antibiotics and, and growth promoting hormones and all of those goodies um and sometimes yeah the the stuff from the us is more like nine, 18 19 dollars a pound um and yeah the the local butchering i'm exactly the same i couldn't tell what the cuts were and i actually got pretty good at finding a reasonable steak at the supermarket there'd usually be one that might be edible on the, in those white plastic trays there might be one that was edible but always they're too fresh they're not aged at all yeah. they're really tough really yeah. tough um, but the, my biggest complaint was, it was actually making me feel sick. And I eventually, since I was back here, worked out what they're putting in the stuff. And there's a long list of additives in this brine, including adding 10% of the, uh, to the weight in water. There's sugar and salt and flavors and flavor enhancers and xanthan gum and carrageenan gum and sodium phosphates and sodium citrate and, uh, sometimes sodium benzoate and none of this stuff you want to eat. It's and we're all are all the meat almost importers or producers all almost all of it okay. is in brine and you'll notice now that i've mentioned it to you if you when you buy one of those premium steaks with it don't put any salt on and have a taste uh you'll start well, to i notice remember it. noticing that with the tomahawks <laughs> i was like yeah those melt in your mouth tomahawks this the reason they melt in your mouth yeah. is because they're soaked in a chemical it that seemed soft, like that it was a little bit off i mean it still tasted good but it was like something they're good eating like yeah the, 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 the very tent like yeah some of those tomahawks are just melt in your mouth they're enormous and they just melt in your mouth they're like this that's incredibly tender how do they yeah. do that and they do that by adding these chemicals that soften the meat and they those chemicals do the same thing to your guts like you don't want to eat that stuff so so learning that made me fairly determined to try to find some good steaks um, and I didn't know if it would be would be possible or not. And so since I moved here, I started looking around, just started asking anybody I could, including when I was on my motorcycle rides and if I'd see some nice cattle, I would ask the local farmer with my terrible Spanish as much as I could about how he raises the cattle and um, visited a few farms, visited, visited a few processing facilities. We found an abattoir and found a, a sort of a, there's not really even the, the supply chain just doesn't exist here. There's, yeah. there's either um, a skinny animal from the hills taken to the unlicensed abattoir, killed and butchered. And the, then the what? You keep saying a abattoir. Um, What's an abattoir? Processing facility, okay. Ma Matadero, okay. um, where they kill and go down to carcass okay. before okay. a butcher. Okay. Yeah, it's Australian terminology maybe. Um, they call it here rastro. Okay. Uh, but in Spanish also matadero. Um, and most of the those facilities here are unlicensed by the government. There are a few government licensed ones, but that 
the, the government doesn't mind though. They let them operate because people need to eat, which is an example of their practical approach at the moment, which is good. But um, it's found a few facilities. Um, yeah, just to finish that story. So the, there are sort of two supply chains here for beef. Uh, one is just unrefrigerated and sold at the local little market and cut up that day and sold without refrigeration fresh. Okay. And that's how a lot of the locals buy And it's usually beef. sold the same day that it's cut up. Yeah, the next few days. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not, that's not good. I don't want to eat that meat yeah. personally. And the other supply chain is soaked in brine, hormone growth promotants, antibiotics, GMO feeds, and then, and then soaked in brine, frozen and thawed many times on its way across two borders from, from Nicaragua or from Honduras or from the United States. And then the box is opened and it's unpacked and it's put on display in the butcher shops here, which are just meat shops. They, yeah. they don't do any butchering. They're the two supply chains. And so I'm fitting right in the middle there. And just it's just a miracle, the farm that I found. And it was a, a local Bitcoiner who reached out to me and said, hey, my father is a cattle farmer, but he's, fr he's frustrated. He's not getting good prices. And maybe you should talk. And then his father put me in touch with another guy who him and his brothers are still cattle farming. They're surrounded by the industrialized sugarcane production that you see a lot of here, um, but they are still cattle farming and they are doing it as best, as good as I've seen anyone raise cattle in the world. And um, I was saying to you before, I've, I've worked in organic agriculture for 20 years. I've visited hundreds of farms, hundreds of organic farms. So, and this farm that I found is better than most of them. It's amazing. They're doing all the good things in terms of rotational grazing and and how many how many head? Uh, they're only running like a thousand. Okay, but that's they, still that's a decent size herd. Yeah. Okay, because I had read and I was reading recently a book on like the history of Central America, and at one time El Salvador was like very well known for their cattle farms. Yeah. Uh, which I was I was reading this, I was kind of shocked. I was like, how could this be? The beef there is is horrible. Yep. But I guess going back. I don't know, it was 30, 40 years ago, there was all over the country these huge farms. Um, it's surprising because it's such a densely populated country. And so I, I was surprised to, to read that. But I don't know if you've looked into the history of that yeah, at I've all. Yeah, I've, I've heard the same. And yeah, it looks like from the history that I've looked at in the photos and so on, it looked like the 70s here must have been an amazing time, like a really good time. Um, and yeah, that was before the agrarian reform. So the Duarte government agrarian reform in the 1980s where they expropriated all the land and, and divided it up in, and put a limit on the size of land you could have. And that just, from my point of view, I, I think that's what basically decimated yeah. agriculture here, especially cattle, because you need a little bit more land to get the economy, economy of scale. So these brothers kept cattle farming and got very efficient and started using methods like rotational grazing, which, or you might call it cell grazing or, um, uh, time controlled grazing. There are many regenerative, you maybe you call it regenerative farming, but basically running as few mobs as possible and moving them regularly, uh, which has all these benefits in terms of productivity and in terms of animal health. It allows the grass to grow back after a rest period. Yeah. It breaks the disease cycle. And all of the good organic farmers and regenerative farmers in the world are, are using some form of this uh, uh, rotational grazing. These guys are doing that and they're not doing it because it feels good or to impress anybody. They're doing it because it's more profitable. They can produce more animals. Um, and the country is terrific. See, yeah, it doesn't jump out at you as maybe being good cattle country because of the population density and the geography, but actually there's a lot of good flat land and there's a lot of good hill country. So there's good breed dry land breeding areas and then there's good irrigated from groundwater. There's heaps of groundwater in some of these spots. Most, most of where you see all the sugar cane, there's yeah. ground, groundwater that just comes out of the ground and they irrigate with it. Um, so there's good finishing country as well. It's very fertile soil, young volcanic fertile soil, well drained as well. So um, it's very possible here and managed to just, I'm so fortunate to have found this excellent farm. And do they just, do they solely graze them? Are they growing any hay or what is the- They're able to irrigate. So okay. even during this very, so that in El Salvador, there's a very dry season yeah. that we're in right now and it's really dry. So um, any cattle operations that are that don't have irrigation water, have to grow fodder crops and conserve hay for what they call the summer for the dry uh, three or four months that are yeah. dry. But these guys are fortunate in that they have basically abundant and good quality groundwater. So they irrigate through the dry season. So they're on grass, grass, hundred percent grass fed, no, no grain supplementation required. 
So talk to me about that because I, I know grass fed beef is, you know, considered the the premium thing, but I growing up we we raised cattle and you would feed them out at the end. You you know, you put them in a smaller pen, you're feeding them grain and that's what always produced the the good marbling, the good fat content through that. And so when I hear grass fed, I I picture these skinny cows wandering the hills and that I wouldn't want to eat it. So explain to me where I'm wrong or how how that Yeah, I think um I think a little bit of grain feeding is probably not a problem, but uh, and it's and it is correct. It's a way to get the marbling, and the tenderness of the beef can be correlated with the level of fat. Uh, but you can also have very lean, very tender grass-fed beef like like mine. But you won't uh, have the the fat content in it. it. It might be tender, but it won't. Yeah, it'll be okay. more generally more lean in in the muscle. Yeah. You can still hopefully get a good fat cover, but you won't get that marbling. But Animals that, uh, so perhaps it was just taken to too much of an extreme in these CAFOs in, in feedlots um, where they're given ad lib grains and the cow arguably is not very well adapted to eating grain. It's much more well adapted to eating grass. And when it eats a lot of grain, it actually gets sick. And the marbling that you're seeing is an obese animal. And most of the fat starts to occur um, around the liver and they get fatty liver disease and they get diabetes. <laughs> and that's why you get a nice fatty, juicy steak. And if you kept feeding an animal like that, it won't live very long. Yeah. A, be a, a cow, that food, it won't live very long. And it, they've taken it so far and just on grain only for, and yeah, it was most of my life, it's been advertised at restaurants as a positive thing, as grain, uh, grain fed or yeah. grain finished. And, um, and the best steak on the menu would be the 120 days grain fed. But I think of that as 120 days of being in a pen with no grass, up to their knees in, in cow crap and being fed low quality, possibly GMO, also fed. Synth since then also you've had the growth promotants and the synthetic urea added to the feed and the constant antibiotics. And the constant antibiotics is not even, I mean, they don't always do that, but the antibiotic use in these sort of factory farms, if we can use that terminology, is for cattle is not even to, to ward off disease. It's because it changes the gut bacteria and makes them get even fatter. Okay. <laughs> it makes them get more fat. And I don't like the taste of that meat. I, that, that taste, I, maybe it's partly psychological, um, but some of the most expensive steaks that I've had, and I think like M9, there's a grading system for how much fat, and it's like, oh, this is 300 days on grain only. And I'm thinking the poor animal, you know, and... Um, and it's mostly fat and and it's very tender, but I actually, it actually makes me feel sick. And I don't know if it's psychological, but uh, a lot of others say the same thing. So I think a little bit of grain feeding in the paddock to finish an animal is fine, but and maybe it just went overboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we always like to take things to the extreme. Yeah. If a little bit's good, <laughs> then, then more is uh, yeah. better. Yeah, so. but you can finish, finish animals on grass only, Okay. Um, but they're not going to have the marbling. Uh, but it can still have good fat cover and it certainly can be tender, especially if you're doing the aging. So one thing that we're doing here is uh, keeping the carcass, so after it's sorted and in quarters, keeping the carcass in the quarter for seven days or maybe a little more, a little less, depending on how it's aging. Um, technically, it's not aging, but I call it aging. It's it's in the cool room for between one and five degrees for, for seven days. And that is the magic ingredient. Uh, for us, for the for the quality, the meat starts to break down a little bit, uh, dries out, it becomes more tender, and the flavor improves. So that's done before it's cut. It's before the butchering. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's after the slaughter and before the butcher. Yeah. Okay. So we collect all the organs on the first day, and they get packed and frozen and so on. But the the meat stays in the cool room, not frozen, just above just above freezing, uh, for up to seven days, and that's when uh, the meat gets better. You lose a bit of weight. So you lose a bit of money that way, but the quality is better. I'll, coming back to Costa Rica, there was a great butcher shop in uh, Bitcoin Jungle and there's a lot of grass-fed beef in Costa Rica and this butcher shop accepted Bitcoin, so I was really excited. And he was a nice guy. He ended up giving me a tour of, of the facility and we were talking about all our different um, methods and stuff. But he, because he has so much throughput, he doesn't have space to age it yeah. at all. So it's cut fresh and I could taste it in the pro It was tough. Unfortunately, it was still great, but it was a bit yeah, chewy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think 
you know, people that don't really know anything about beef, they think, oh, the fresher, the better. But yeah, if, well, you, I, yeah, if you don't, don't have that much aging. Certainly in El Salvador, I think I'm the only person doing that. Everyone here wants it fresh, like you say. Whether that's because they're having trouble, it costs to put, keep the cool room running for a week and to have that space, yeah. like to, to use that space, it slows down the supply chain. And I think that's why some of these chemical brines evolve, started being used is because, oh, we can tenderize this meat and we can make it taste better straight away. We don't need to run the, the cool room for a week anymore and have all that extra space. I think that's probably why they started doing that. Locally, I don't know why. Well, my farm, my supplier, he ages for seven days as well, but he's the only one that I've met locally that usually they cut it fresh and, and eat this well, terrible I think too there's, there's a you know, concern of it being kept at the right temperature. So it's it, for them, it's, if the fresher the better. Like if it hasn't been sitting around as long, there's less chance that something could have gone wrong during that time. Because yeah. obviously if you're aging at the wrong temperature, then that's where you get It can go very wrong, poisoning. yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, I guess that maybe that's it. And it just hasn't, the new supermarket supply chain, which is refrigerated, hasn't they haven't adapted to that yet they're still thinking that it's needs to be killed and and not hang out without refrigeration yeah. for too long because it's going to go bad yeah so how does the what you're attempting to do I'm, I'm assuming it's more expensive than these other processes what how does it compare on a dollar per pound basis versus the stuff that's imported and brined and um, so the prices in El Salvador, from what I've found, are the cheapest meat is the ground, the ground beef, which can be three or four dollars a pound, and the most expensive is, like you say, around twenty dollars a pound USDA, um, USDA sort of certified, um, quite fatty. Um, we are coming in between in the middle there, uh, at around ten dollars a pound for mixed cuts. So you get a mixed pack. Just to keep it simple for now, because I'm kind of just addressing the problems as they arise. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some ground. So, beef so would that be mostly ground steaks. beef and half, 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 half. Okay, yeah, half sort of premium cut, premium, a couple of premium steaks, a T-bone and a ribeye, and then maybe some ribs, and then maybe some diced meat for a stew or or a bit of puyasso or something, a roast, and then uh, three or four pounds of ground. But it's really good ground beef. Like it's really good for hamburgers. It's basically still premium beef. It's just some of the tougher cuts. Yeah. Um, so we're just grinding them and, and making, and so yeah, coming in at ten dollars. So we're kind of it's expensive, but I think it's about what I need to charge to make it work. Yeah, uh, and we'll see. And so, what? Who do you view as your market? Do you think it's mostly going to be expats? Do you think there's a big local market, or what? What's your kind of plan? It's so far, it's this? well, whoever wants to buy from me. So far, it's expats and bitcoiners. Yeah, because yeah. we've all had the same frustration that you mentioned. It's just like the beef here, the seafood's great, and you can get good good chicken and pork and um but you just basically can't get good beef you yeah. can get what kind of looks good and tastes good at first and it's tender and it melts in your mouth but it makes you feel a bit sick and and it's from nicaragua uh so yeah people who are concerned about that and i only accept bitcoin too so that's uh filtering for yeah. for the expats <laughs> um mostly expats so far but we've got a few locals now on on the customer list as well which okay. is exciting and we're just talking to a distributor who are, who are very much a local business um a local family business who who might want to start distributing the product as well so that'll open up because i'd love to i mean yeah i really want i really want to see the local food the the community uh, resilience improve for whatever the next crisis might be um and connect the farmer with the growers yeah so i i don't want it to just be an expat thing i definitely want to and and there are, I have met quite a few locals who are interested in quality local food. Still, only it's still a minority. Most locals will still sort of say, "Why are you doing that? Right? Why are you exporting or are you importing?" And I know it's local food for local people. That sort of seems like a strange concept to most of them, but some some are already uh, health conscious and wanting to buy local local dairy products and local meat products. So they're excited to get on the customer list. And even those people, they haven't the cost hasn't been a problem to them. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, Andy, can you throw up? I think I think we have a picture of uh, was this your first kill. Uh, this is the second second kill. Okay. <clears throat> this one was much bigger, actually, it dressed down to five hundred and sixteen pounds. So that's the weight. As so a, so what would that be live weight? Uh, I don't know. We haven't got scales, so but you, you lose a lot from. I don't know whether it might. Is it about half, or is it? I'm I'm trying to remember when I was 
a kid <clears throat> I raised steers and they would usually come in about a thousand pounds after we would feed them out at the end. I don't know. Yeah, you can lose up to half. Yeah, it'd probably be eight hundred to a thousand okay. pound animal. It was only like a two year old heifer. And and what breed? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the genetics here are um, mixed. It's mostly Brahmin, uh, so the Indian style of cattle. Uh -huh. um, and Bra Brahmin dairy cross mostly, and and most people Brahmin what Brahmin huh? dairy cross, so dairy. different different okay. dairy breeds okay. like Hol Holstein and Brown Swiss. Okay, um, but this one looked at have a little bit more English breed like Angus in it to me, but I'm not an expert. I'm not a butcher, and I'm not a genetics expert. <clears throat> but um, and most ma many people you speak to in Australia or the United States will say, oh, Brahmin beef's terrible, um, and I don't. I think where that misconception has come from is a selection bias. I think studies that have been done on Brahmin cattle. So Brahmin is a Bos indicus. It's a subspecies. It's the same species, but it's a subspecies, they call it. And it's the animals with the big droopy ears and the bulls sometimes have a hump. So those looking cattle. And you usually see them in more warmer climates. Yeah, the tropical cattle. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so they're much better adapted to tropical or, or arid uh, conditions because they have a thick yeah. skin and they can store some fat in that lump and... Uh, um, and they've got e the big ears to shoo the flies away and they're, they're much better adapted to these conditions. They can kind of live without water for days. They're amazing animals. We don't do that, but they're amazing animals. Um, there is a misconception, I'll, I'll say, that they produce poor quality beef. And I think that's come from selection bias because it, um, most of those animals are in very poor areas and they're hungry animals. Um, and they haven't been well looked after. So they, when you kill one of those animals and you try the beef, yeah, it's terrible because every 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 dry season they're almost starving. And yeah. you see some of those cattle around; they're very skinny, you know, and that's why they're walking them through town. They're trying to find some feed. Um, so I don't think that it's the genetics that causes that quality issue. And so far, the the evidence is in the product. It's really good meat. Uh, I'm I'm sure you're going to be happy with it. So the, yeah, they're Brahmin mostly. Um, there's probably opportunities to improve the genetics, but it doesn't seem to be the weakest link at the moment. Okay. Um, having some, what I call in the English, so uh, Bos Taurus, that's probably not accurate to say English, but I say Indian English cattle. And they've got the smaller ears, uh, more compact, uh, thinner skins, generally better for beef in terms of production. So Angus and- uh, Does it and carry a little bit more fat? Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, better fat cover as well. Um, known to be more tender but my meat's very tender so they're crossbreeds um so they're they're very well adapted here um so i'm not really too worried about the genetics many people will say oh that, that meat's going to be terrible or, oh you need to get this breed or you need to get this breed or you need uh, i just don't see it it's um the much more important to raise the animal well and have it well fed and well looked after and uh and you'll still get a good product so are you having them cut in what, I mean, I don't know if they cut meat differently in Australia than they do <laughs> in the U.S., but I know for sure in El Salvador, they, they have different cuts. So are you having cuts that would be more familiar to expats or uh, yeah, we've got local nice, cuts? or nice what's the... there, but yeah, you're, see, I'm not a butcher. So um, the butchering was a real challenge and I'm probably still need help with, with the butchering, although it'll be okay like this is a good t-bone as you can see there's not yeah. heaps there's not heaps of fat cover but it's there's a little bit of yeah, marbling yeah, actually yeah, in yeah. That. yeah um they were beautiful beautiful t-bones no problem with them at all um and butchering the t-bones was easy um butchering the ribeyes was easy but some of the other cuts the terminology for the cuts here i think it's almost lost um piasso can mean i don't mean to be critical maybe i'm wrong but piasso can kind of mean a lot of things yeah here. yeah 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 right and lomo lomo de res can mean you know any sort of cut so we had trouble um and that's partly why i'm doing half of the animal as ground beef because a lot of there's probably some good leg steaks and shoulder steaks that i could that i could select but the the butcher that i'm using local guy is excellent um but he, uh he doesn't know how to do those cuts and i don't know either so we're we're doing just some more we're, wherever we're in doubt we're just grinding it and making great burger patty type type beef like you can see it's a pretty fatty yeah uh, ground that looks beef, like it has chunky good. style fat it's beautiful um but so we're getting the t-bones and we're getting the ribeyes next time we're going to do the ribeyes on the bone because they're but they're more familiar with doing it that way yeah and then getting the short ribs and 
uh, and some of the sirloin uh, cuts were identifying correctly and and uh, and wrapping separately. And uh, yeah, it's coming out pretty well. But if there's any uh, skilled butchers and and someone who can translate the nomenclature of, of the different cuts, that'd be really handy if they want to reach out. Well, I a few years ago, I was at a, a trade show uh, in the food business in the US and part of the trade show, they brought in a side of beef into the kitchen and, and butchered it in front of us. And they kind of went through and they're like, okay, you could either make this cut out of this right. by cutting it here, or you can cut it here and get this cut. But I was looking <laughs> at it, it's not, you think like, oh, it's, it's just obvious. obvious. Yeah. You just cut this, but no, <laughs> you're looking at it you're like, wait, how would you know to yeah. cut that line here and on that seam and to make it that? There so was one really funny moment during the last butchering where the butcher, he ha had a piece of the animal, sort of part of the ribs, um, part of the lower front ribs, I think it was, and, and he was sitting it on the bandsaw, but he, he turned it over and he turned it around and he turned it over and he turned it around again and he turned it over and turned it around about 20 times and I was thinking, <laughs> he couldn't work out how to get that cut out. Well, he worked it out in the end, but yeah, it was a bit unfamiliar for him. Yeah. That was a challenge, but it came out all right. So, I mean, it's an art. You'd think that mm. it'd be just like, oh yeah, these are cuts, but it, yeah. I'm They're, watching YouTube yeah. at the moment. There's everything you need to know about butcherings on YouTube, fortunately. So I'm going to apply myself uh, to, to learning a few of those cuts and, and we are looking out for, for a skilled butcher as well, but it's good enough for now. Well, hopefully you can get some uh, tri tips out of there. I don't know. We managed. Yep. Oh, did we you? got the tri tip. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So, and uh, I'd have to check my notes, but I think another name for that is it bottom sirloin? Another I, name? I for think it? it depends how you cut it. Yeah. I think like the tri tip it, is. It good. I think it came out of actually California, that specific yep. cut. And it has um, three, almost three parts to it. You can see in the steak that there's three parts or well, it's a big it's like a big piece, like yeah. a big roast almost um usually the and it has like a big fat covering on the one side usually yeah um it's, it's one of my favorite meats to, to grill in in the u.s but i have never seen them here so we got something that we were calling tri-tip okay. it was a really good steak it was out of the sirloin area we cross-checked it because even the, the the names are different even in england and the u.s and then in Australia again, the names are different. Yeah. We I've never heard of tri tip from Australia. So, but but yeah, someone I think asked for even, that. Even people on the East Coast in the U.S. Right. haven't really heard of it, but on yeah. the West Coast, it's a big thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would love to to check that out. Uh, I have to get on your get on your list on here. So, list, yep. so what uh, what pound increments do you sell to people? We're just doing mix, mixed pack at the moment. Seven but pound mixed pack. Seven pack. Seven yeah. pound. Okay. Yeah. To, okay. Just to keep it simple and so. I don't know where it's going to go. I basically just keep saying yes to everyone on things and see how things evolve. Yeah. Um, but well, except for if people are asking for specific cuts at the moment, I'm having to say no. And we're just doing these mixed cuts at one price. And because, uh, you know, you don't get very many T-bones and ribeyes. Yeah. You get a lot of other stuff. So. You get a lot of hamburger. I remember that yeah. from uh, half, Raising half Cattle. Yeah. 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 So you'd yeah. have... We'd, we'd, we'd butcher like one a year for ourselves and you, you tend to eat all the steaks and then you got hamburger for the, yeah. for the next uh, three months. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool that you used to do that. Yeah. We did a little bit as when I grew up as well. Yeah. It's good to have that um, connection with where the food comes from. And it's incredible how much food you get from one yeah. beast. Like the, yes, yeah, like a thousand meals maybe out of one one animal so and the 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 killing method here is is really good so so that's good just a pop to the head or uh it's a it's a method that um they actually sever the the spinal column okay very carefully with a very sharp implement um so it's not what is considered best practice these days in europe or australia or the us but it was considered best practice not that long ago. And in, I think in Europe, it's still, it's, it was apparent, some, some people from Spain came here and taught them how to do it. Okay. And I've seen, I'm there for every kill and it seems really good. I mean, we, we used to just use a rifle in the paddock at my farm. Yeah. And that, it feels like maybe that's a bit more, well, there are pros and cons because the downside of that is that, they're, that their friends all see it. You know, so you're out in the paddock and yeah, it's yeah, instant. Yeah. It's really instant. Like you can't imagine that the animal's been through any pain, but the other animals are pretty confused yeah. about what's going yeah. on. So the, so the benefit of doing it this way is that the other animals don't see it or hear it or anything. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, 
like that. So, so, so what's good. what's your goal as far as to? I know you're just figuring this out as you go <laughs> along, but um, I don't know if you have any objectives of hey, we want to do ten this year or. Oh, what no, year? we'll get into a weekly schedule pretty quick, okay. I think. Yeah, the aim is to get into a weekly schedule, provided the demand's there. I think yeah. it will be. Um, and then beyond that, um, well, I want to help locally and improve the food situation and the food resilience here. And so I've been talking to Texas Slim about this stuff and the El the idea of the El Salvador Beef Initiative because he's gaining a bit of momentum. And he was just in Australia and did nine events. Bitcoin meetups and I, I'm not I'm not familiar with Texas Slim. Texas said. Slim, where okay. have you been, Mike? Uh, apparently not where I need to be. No, he's a, a Twitter character. Uh, he's a Bitcoiner and okay. he's a he's a genuine beef producer. He's very experienced. He's from Texas, um, and he is seems very driven at the moment to spread the word of shake your rancher's hand. So meet your local farmer and and get the best food on the planet, which, which is beef, in my opinion best for the environment, best for your health. It's, it's great stuff. Um, so he is traveling the world and talking about connecting consumers with their local beef producers, which is something they've been interested in for a long time. And in Australia, uh, there are some great farmers selling direct now. It's much harder in Australia in terms of trying to do it legally. Um, it's very expensive to get the necessary approvals and so on. Yeah. But so I'd love to see, well, there's just no local agriculture here. It's crazy. Um, a lot of the fruit and veg is imported from Guatemala and a lot of the meat comes from Nicaragua or Honduras or the United States. Uh, I would like to see local food resilience. And I'm also pretty concerned about the health of the locals. The, all of these tenders serve just junk food, completely wall-to-wall -wall junk yeah. food, sugary drinks. Ton and, of obesity and diabetes and yeah. So I think beef is a really important part of maybe trying to address some of those problems. It's not the only solution. I don't know what the solution yeah. is. It's hard to. Yeah, it's hard because beef is is never going to be cheap, and so for the the wages here, it's always going to be a struggle for it to be you know a huge part of their diet. So, I mean, un unless the economy mm. continues to improve and we see this you know become the next Singapore, then then that's a different situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty likely. All of the ingredients are here, but um, I guess I have. I haven't put too much thought into that. I need to think that through some more, but I'd like to see more people doing what I'm doing as well. And just because there are still some good beef producers around uh, and there are other beef producers who are frustrated and getting paid not very much by the supermarket and um, and going and there and there's this huge incentive for them to, go, to grow sugarcane with maximum pesticide and maximum synthetic fertilizer because they don't have to do anything. They just get a paid a commission by the sugar company. Yeah. Um, so I'd love for them to see that the beef guys are making the money and start doing regenerative or organic or rotational grazing methods and producing beef because that's better for the land and it's better for everyone's health here. It's better. For, I think it'll be better for the economy as well. Um, but I don't want to come in and try to tell them how to do things, but there's already some very good cattle farmers here. So spreading the word on the methods, I'd like to see all that. I, I can't do all of that. Talk, that's why I'm talking to Texas Slim and that's why any of the listeners who are interested in helping, I mean, there are people who say, I want to buy land in El Salvador and and it's, there's going to be a lot of challenges with that. Um, one, one thing I was very clear on not wanting to do when I came here was, was buying land and growing cattle. I was not going to do that myself, having just done it for a couple of years in yeah. Australia. There'd be so many challenges to do that here, but I wanted to try to find good local farmer and it's a miracle that I, that I found these guys. Um, I'd like to find more. I'm just curious: is there is there land at a higher elevation, or is it low land? No, or it's what? in Sonsonate region. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the younger cattle come from the hill country, from the villages, and they drive around to the village and they pay cash for the six month old okay. animals, and they bring them down and raise them for another year on the good country, which is not very elevated there. No. In the in the local market, not what you're doing, but the when they're just selling these things to market, what what type of price per pound are they getting? you know on the i don't really know i only know supermarket and butcher shop prices yeah. so the local market that non-refrigerated stuff at the local market that's probably pretty cheap that's probably two bucks a pound but i don't know yeah yeah it'd be interesting to know 
the the ranchers that you're working with are they excited about this do they yeah, see very, this as yeah being... this is amazing okay. <laughs> such cool guys they're really funny i'm keeping the i'm keeping the supplier pr uh, private for now yes yeah. um um but one day i'd love to do farm tours and so on once once we've got a better uh once we've really got a solid relationship and i'm not worried about having the business st stolen from from me um they are really excited. They want to work with me. They want to make it big. That's sort of something they wanted to do anyway, but didn't um, sort of maybe know how or had the time. They want to focus on producing, but they wanted to sell direct to customers and market it as local and market it as grass fed. So there was a lot of alignment there. And um, they're also interested in Bitcoin. So really? that's really cool. Yeah. Prior to meeting you or uh, just through this whole process? A little bit of interest, okay. yeah. So, um, yeah, they're, they're generally supportive of the current government. Are you able to pay them in Bitcoin yet? We're getting there. Okay. We're getting there and I'm confident that they will. But I, I'm trying to be very honest about, you know, the, how much the price can go up and down yeah. and all that stuff. And because it would be terrible if they aped in and then, yeah. Went, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then they'd blame it on me. So I'm, making, I'm being very clear about, but yeah, we've already done a few Bitcoin transactions. Uh, I tipped them initially, and and now they're also going to accept part payment in Bitcoin, and uh, that of course also then will require me to show them how to use cold storage. So we'll take that little by little. But they're keen and excited. I show them a cold card. I talked about the Chivo. They're already using Chivo, and the benefits of other wallets like Bitcoin Beach Wallet, now called Blink, and are, the benefits are, of self. -custody. What's their experience been like using Chivo? Have they connected it to their bank account? Or? Yeah, he's got okay. it connected. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to have gotten better. I can't use it because I don't have a Dewey. But, yeah, uh, I, I'm not. You have to have a passport to to use Chivo. And is it you can use it if you have a company? A company can get Chivo. A company can get Chivo, and Salvadorans can get Chivo. Yeah. And it's I, I like the integration with with the banking system. It's it incredible. makes things really good. Yeah. I think Chivo is under the same pressure and stresses from the US government and these other things because we've had a, a lady that works with us, she had her wallet basically frozen, shut down, and they were concerned about transactions that, that I had sent her from a Wasabi wallet. And so the fact that it came from a Wasabi wallet, they flagged it on their end. And you know, I sat in a meeting with them like, wow, privacy is, is a right. It's important for Bitcoiners. If you're going to flag transactions that come from any wallet that makes privacy or coin join, you know, part integrated part of that procedure, then you're going to defeat what's trying to be accomplished here. And so, you know, it's I think we as Bitcoiners need to keep putting pressure on Chivo, on the government, on these people, because they're getting pressure from the other mm -hmm. direction saying, mm -hmm. hey, you need to sanction these type of transactions. You need to and, and we weren't even talking about huge amounts of money. I mean, it was I was like, really, you guys are like worried about, you know, these trifling sums of money going through this wallet. But they're so risk adverse and so like afraid of being flagged or accused of money, you know, aiding money laundering. And and the sad thing is, though, if they allow that pressure to um, direct how this plays out, they're just going to recreate the broken banking system. Mm. And so. I think it's important for Bitcoiners to speak up and say, hey, <laughs> this is not acceptable. It has to work. It can't be, we can't have to worry about getting our wallet unfrozen. And so, yeah. yeah well, I have noticed a few locals express concern about large transactions. And even when I say large, even just over a thousand dollars, they generally say, well, the bank will ask a lot of questions. They're, they're very aware that the banks will be very difficult if you're trying to do large transactions here, a lot of transactions are still done in cash, even large ones like, yeah. like 20,000, 30,000, they still use cash here, which is great. I want to hang on to cash, but um, I, I'm surprised to hear that. I, I didn't know that that they were even monitoring incoming UTXOs to that level. That's Yeah, I was surprising. surprised because yeah. they were asking about specific and I'm like, are you concerned because it came from Wasabi? They're like, yeah. I mean, they didn't want to, Tell me, wow. but I basically I'm like. And it, were the funds unfrozen? If you don't mind me asking. Eventually, yeah. but now we're running into the same issue where where she can use her Chiba wallet, but she can't 
the bank won't allow her to transact back and forth between dollars and, and Bitcoin. And That's so, a big problem. Yeah. I haven't heard of any cases like that. And I agree with whatever we can do to try to head that off. It, it's hard because we don't generally have access to Chivo. So yeah. we, don't, we don't know these problems are happening. Um, That's so what I told the, the guys from Chivo. I'm like, I'm actually glad this happened because I don't use Chivo and I might not realize it. Yeah. But this is a problem. You guys need to fix this. You can't be censoring, you know, anybody who. Well, yeah, and it's not just a technical problem because Chivo's had its problems yeah. too. It's not a technical problem. It's actually no. This, uh, this was a design. A, they're they're trying to do this. They <laughs> they think they're doing their job by doing this, but they're just creating the same friction and the same problems that right. have held the economy back in El right. Salvador. So yep. that was my pushback. Like, really, in the U.S., they would never freeze or or even be worried about this size of transaction so you're letting the u.s government push on you a level of scrutiny that they don't put on their own businesses in the u.s like that's crazy so hopefully and i understand they don't want to get shut down they don't want to be sanctioned they don't want to lose access to swift but they need to push back so yeah i don't understand how it works in terms of the regulatory burden and or overreach from the US or from elsewhere and maybe it was just an overzealous um sort of a KYC company you know one of the, yeah. that was engaged to and they're trying to prove that, that that they were uh doing their job and that was one of their one of the Well I know was, that they are under the microscope like that was one of the things from the get go that the IMF the US government yeah. has said hey this is going to be used by money launderers right. and drug dealers and yeah. this and that and so they they are looking to find something like that and so and I, I understand now. they they want to stay on their toes but you can't let them torpedo the the value of this open protocol by you know forcing you to put these crazy you know restrictions on how money moves around so totally agree yeah i chivo seems to have improved in functionality i've heard good good things about how it's getting better and when people if the, if something does go wrong you usually get your money back you might have to spend some time on a phone to a customer service um the banking connections from what i've so i've had i've a little bit of involvement in it not directly obviously because i can't have chivo maybe once i get my company structure and I'll, I'll start using chivo because of those bank connections they're excellent any any bank i think it's all through one the the semi-government bank uh hypothecario yeah. here allow you to do instant transfers for a very low fee between all of the different banks but if they're also flagging things willy-nilly then yeah that's just going to make it unusable um so so hopefully the right person is listening <laughs> yeah hopefully it's just growing pains and they'll figure these things out but that's what i kept stressing them don't recreate the same yeah. broken system um because then that defeats the purpose you're going to go to basically unbanking everybody again because yeah i mean i'm i'm a bit conflicted about chivo because ultimately having a government wallet doesn't align well with the the whole idea of bitcoin either but having the banking connections would be good yeah is, is good and and makes things easier for people locally because it's very common for people to still queue up at a bank for sometimes for hours yeah. to, just to pay bills and so um so these systems that they've built here actually allow you to, to not do that um but yeah generally the idea of a government bitcoin wallet doesn't make much sense to me either so i i have this my image is at some at some point chivo fails and that's going to be the good a good thing i'm not sure um how that'll play out um if the government wallet is too good then everyone will put their bitcoin in the government wallet instead of self-custodying yeah and then that can be a fragile situation too so some level of dysfunction with the government wallet <laughs> may urge people to use at least a non-government one or even then take the step to self-custody so i don't know it's, yeah. it's a com complex issue yeah no there's a lot especially in the bitcoin space there's a lot of different opinions on it but um but i have seen just on the practical level that it's it helps to get people using and accepting yeah. bitcoin just the ease of being able to pay their bills directly from that account or to move it to dollars when they need to or to, to move it back to bitcoin when they want to yeah. and so um you know i'm, I'm hoping in, in the ideal world i think we'd have a well-functioning chivo wallet but it wouldn't have an overwhelming amount of the the market yep. there would be people that would still hold stuff in cold storage maybe they use that yep. 
for some of their daily spending, but they're using, you know, Bitcoin Beach Wallet, or, which is Blink now, Blink, but they just yeah. switched it. Um, or, you know, some of the other, you know, Moon Wallet or the other great wallets that, yeah. that are out there. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I agree with that. That's, that's probably a good yeah. path that hopefully it'll play out that way. Um, that reminds me of one of the, in, in Bitcoin Jungle in Costa Rica, they, uh, the guys there are helping the vendors. There are a lot of vendors accepting Bitcoin and they're using a wallet that's called Bitcoin Jungle and it's an exact copy. It's the same code yeah, yeah. as Bitcoin Beach Wallet from Galloway. But one thing that looks different in the app is the payment, uh, the receiving QR code. It's a BTC Pay server QR code that pops up because they run their own BTC Pay server. And once the vendors start having a certain amount too much, too much money in in their Bitcoin account in their in their hosted wallet or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they go to that vendor with a cold card, and they teach the vendor how to do self custody with a cold card. Which so that's great. That's and pretty that's, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, big respect to the Bitcoin Jungle guys for for how they're rolling that out. That's really cool. How how easy was it to live on Bitcoin while you were there? I, I haven't made it down there yet, so I'm very curious as to how easy it is to spend Bitcoin? Um, in Uvita, it was pretty good. So Butcher and one of the supermarkets and some of the cafes, but not as good as here. Um, certainly nothing to do with government or renting cars yeah. or anything like that. Could, could you pay with Bitcoin? But uh, a lot of vendors in Uvita, but not as good as here. I, almost all my expenses now I pay in Bitcoin here every day. My rent, I was trying to work, it's only my gas, the gas bottles that I have to pay cash for and and the drinking water, um, everything else. My rent, Which, my electricity, my what mobile What about phone. fuel? Um, yeah, the I actually pay cash for fuel only because their point of sale devices don't work well and the new place haven't got Bitcoin point of sale yet. Okay. But the, most I of haven't those, found any gas stations that. Oh, the Super 7s do, but it's an old Athena point of sale okay. device and it's not worth trying. Yeah. It's uh, on chain and you run into RBF problems. So uh, normally for gas, uh, for the car, I'm, I'm paying cash yeah. as well. But for my rent and electricity and mobile phone and internet um, and the, the supermarket down in San Blas, the new supermarket there, all of the vendors in the little strip mall, uh, except Bitcoin. Oh, really? Yeah. And that, that and new, that new, the new one. Yeah, the really? spot. Yeah, everything except the pharmacy, but okay. all the others. So the the butcher shop, <laughs> the meat shop, and uh, was and there the somebody that went in there and onboarded everybody, or was no, this naturally happened? There were different. Some of them are with Athena, and some were with Strike, and have switched to Athena, and some are using Chivo. So okay. no, they just all did it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really want one of the gas stations to, I mean, a few of them say, oh yeah, we take Bitcoin and you try to pay, but it's really, it's it's Chivo through some integrated banking app. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but it ties into yeah, the, the Chivo app. Yeah. I'm like, that's not Bitcoin, but in their mind, they're, they're accepting Bitcoin, so. Yeah, there's a Bitcoin logo on the, on the, on the brochure from yeah. the bank that they deal with yeah. and, they, and it doesn't, it's a different QR yeah. code. It's not even a Bitcoin one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll keep hassling them at the new, and there's another, there's another new service station opening very soon. So we'll, we'll start hassling them there as well. And your electric bill, you're able to pay that with Bitcoin? Through my real estate agent. Okay. Because okay. <laughs> bit refill, that. you could for a long time I, with bit refill. Oh. And then they had some issue anymore? or whatever, oh. and they, I see they that forced that, them to pull it off. So oh, okay. I don't know if that's been resolved or. I, I checked which bit refill. Uh, my my electricity provider wasn't on bit refill, yeah. but two of the others but are. The, the Del Sur, which is probably yours, that, that's ours here. That yeah. it used to be, you could oh, pay okay, with it, yeah. and now it's not on there anymore. Yeah, so. I'm doing it with the help of my okay. with my real estate okay. agent. Fortunately, yeah. yeah. So are you thinking you're going to stay in the area that you're at there on the coast or? Well, you... no, it's a bit hot to yeah. be honest. And I don't surf, so um, I, I motorcycle. So um, I'm looking around. Uh, El Salvador has many different microclimates, as you know. Um, so you can go from, uh, today I had a look at just at Comasagua, which is only less than an hour's drive. Um, but you go a full thousand meters of elevation um, and up above the thousand meter line, it, it's a lot cooler, yeah. especially at night. It's a much, for me, it's a much more pleasant climate. 
the, the coffee farm we bought, mm. part of it is at 1,500 meters. Mm. And it, you can be from El Zante in 40 minutes. Yeah. So it's it's pretty crazy. Yeah, and your ears hurt when you yeah, get down yeah. and, and it's cold up there. You, yeah. if, you've got to remember to bring a jacket. And then you can go even further. You can get above 2,000 meters. So, and you've got pine forests and stuff like that. So there are a lot of options here. Um, I'm looking at the different different towns on the Ruta de los Flores, like Acahutla, uh, no, sorry, like uh, Huayua and, and Apaneca and Ataco. Uh-huh. Also, I really like Sushi Toto, but it's still pretty hot. It's still pretty warm in yeah, Sushi Toto. It's yeah. only five, 600 meters. So um, not sure. But if you get even a little bit of elevation here and you get the sea breeze, if you combine those two, then it's more comfortable. I mean, if even, you love the even, heat, then even it's Even San Salvador is, oh, it's is Perfect nice climate. weather. I mean, a couple months a year, it may be a little hot and muggy, but in general, it's very pleasant. San so. Salvador is a really good climate. Yeah. yeah, it's like 20 degrees Celsius at night and thirty low 30s in the day. And if you're on the edge of a hill and you get the breeze, it's perfect. Yeah. You don't need to use the air conditioner at all. Here it's, um, yeah, it can be 25 to 35 kind yeah. of. And tw- 25 at night is still pretty warm. So I'm using the air conditioner, which, yeah. So I'm not sure where I want to be. Long answer to your question, sorry. But um, it's very nice here, um, but it gets even hotter. That, one of my concerns about Bitcoin City is it's hot down it there. It is hot there. <laughs> That's what I tell people. I I'm like. But maybe up the volcano you could live on the edge uh, of town. It's still going to be warm. I mean, but. You know, they build in very, you know, look at Dubai or some of these other places yep. that they build these cities. But you're going to be living in an air conditioned tower there for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Or unless you are right up on the volcano, that'll probably be the premium Maybe uh, this is a good real estate there. Like, uh, like, like in San Salvador, maybe you get that breeze yeah. um, on the edge of the volcano that, that keeps you cool. Not sure. Yeah. yeah, but it's hot down that way, down La Union, San Miguel way. Like th- 38 degrees is not uncommon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the hotter time of the year, but it's but it's and it's muggy too. I mean, yeah. it's uh, <laughs> it's beautiful down there. I love that part mm-hmm. of the country, um, but yeah, it's uh, you have to be accustomed to, to warm weather. So. I'm surprised there are there are Bitcoin. I was worried about living where I live now in San Blas that there might not be very many Bitcoiners around. Um, I thought the the centers would be El Zonte and San Salvador, but um we're everywhere it seems maybe not the towns in the hills so much but there are heaps of bitcoiners yeah. up, up my way as well and, and further down the coast that way too so but maybe you have to blaze a trail a little bit and, and once if if i was to set up up in Ataco or apaneca um maybe some more i bitcoiners think it keeps or, spreading out um mm-hmm. the the rents and the prices of things in el zante have have gone up quite a bit and so i think you can get a lot more house and send the, the San Blas area and some of the other areas closer to La Libertad. Um, so I think you're seeing people kind of stretch out. out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there just aren't that many houses in El Zonte. Yeah. There's still a lot of vacant blocks, but uh, yeah. So the rent in El Zonte can be high. Yeah. Uh, you can pay, yeah, 2000 a month for something small here, whereas you can pay half that only 20 minutes away. Yeah. yeah. No. So I think, and I think that's a good thing. I think we're seeing, you're seeing mm. Bitcoiners kind of spread out throughout. The, I think it started mostly at the coast because, you know, a lot of this started here in El Zante, but now people are finding out there's beautiful mountain areas and hill areas and places where the weather's better. And so. Well, there are places with nicer beaches than Zante. Yeah. yeah Zante is not even necessarily the nicest beach. There, there are beautiful beaches and cliffs and, and, uh, uh, and hills, hill areas. And yeah, there's a pretty beautiful landscape. It's so changeable through the season too. Like now it's dry, yeah, so dry. But then uh, in a few months, um, it's going to be lush and green, all this this hillside again. So look, look we, forward to that. We have a property on the other end of the country in a place called Punta Mongo. And mm. we, we bought it one year during the dry season. And I had to go back to the US to run my business and came back during the wet season. And I was like, this isn't our property. This is, it looked <laughs> <Where am> so <laughs> different. Even yeah. the road, it was a dirt road that going in, but it had like trees and stuff growing up just in that yep. short time. And I, I was like, no yeah, way, now, this is it. This, this time way. of year, you can actually see through the, there's less foliage and you can see yeah. through into the villages and stuff like that. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. but that all thickens back up pretty, pretty quickly, I think. Yeah. yeah. So for people that are listening, first, where can they find out about uh, getting on your uh, list for this uh Grass-fed beef. What's the? Is there a waiting list right now, or how we have does a that waiting? Work? Yeah, we've got a customer list, and we let people know when there is meat available, and then it's first in, first served. Okay. Um, so we'll be sending out another message um, probably on Monday. 
So they just contact you. Easiest way to find me on Twitter. Twitter? Yeah, okay. So beef back better. Okay. Beef back better on Twitter. Just uh, DM me and then I'll reply and get your details and we'll we'll send out the message we're delivering between El Zonte and well, El Zonte and San Salvador, but we're also going down to Costa del Sol actually. So uh, we're we're delivering for now. And uh, yeah, ask me anything and and give the meat a try and I'm interested to hear feedback. We've got some of we're gonna cater provide the beef for some events coming up too so there's oh, going to really? be some I, I won't mention i'm not sure if they've announced yet so i won't mention the names but look out for the beef at some upcoming bitcoin events in the next uh, month or so and uh and maybe go along there and try it out as well, well let us know we'll, we'll we'll push it out on twitter when it's uh when it's public we'll um, do for sure i'll have to make sure i make it to at least one of them to to try it out where else can people follow you? Is Twitter just the best place? Twitter's the main thing uh, okay. for now, yeah. I'm okay. also beef back better on Nostra. Okay. Uh, when I figure out how to use it, <laughs> I'll have to, have to try to find you. Yeah, I'll have to figure it out a little bit more too, yeah. Um, any other initiatives or things you want people to know about or any other cool projects that you think are kind of burgeoning that, that people might not have heard of? Well, there's so many out. opportunities here. If you're a little bit entrepreneurial and have a rough idea of what you want to do, they need just about everything here. So this is truly the land of opportunity. I, and I think you mentioned maybe something like Singapore in future. I think it's very, actually, yeah, I'm very bullish on on the direction of the country. And it's it's so exciting and pleasing to be living somewhere where we're on a positive trajectory <laughs> rather than in Australia and the US and Europe where things are just getting worse. Um, so it's a great place to be. Um, I'd like to do more with the the health stuff, the healthy tender idea. I don't know how to do that. So if anyone has ideas about that, uh, reach out. And I don't personally want to buy land and start farming cattle now, but if there are people interested in that, then pl please reach out because uh, I could help make that happen now if if someone wanted to invest. I think I know enough now to, and I know enough people, more importantly, know enough local people who know how to do it, that we could find some good cattle country um, and and get get some good beef production going on here. Awesome. Well, I would love- Do you know anyone? To, <laughs> I, I would love we'll talk later. I would love to uh, see the, the beef market here in, improve. I mean, I think that pers personally, selfishly, I would love to see that. But obviously, just for the the country to become more food secure and not be one of these places where you just have export crops and then you bring in, you know, the subpar uh, imports from other places. Exactly. So, yeah. Me too. Um, I think seeing people like you come in with a different take on it, you know, teaming up with uh, you know some of the great local teams and taking it in a different direction, I think we're going to just see lots of exciting things like that happening here in El Salvador. So that's why I'm so bullish here on El Salvador is it's like you said, there's just this palatable energy here. These people from all over the world that are motivated, that are energetic, that have a positive view of the future. And you have within the local community, just this real sense of destiny that, okay, this is El Salvador's time. And so I think bringing those components together, I think we're going to see just a ton of exciting things. Yeah. So. And yeah. And the, the, the recent tax law announcement that Bekele made is a really good sign for not not specifically for agriculture, but for him uh, actually delivering on some of the stuff he's been hinting at for a while and for the potential for the future here. And the attitude with it's still bureaucratic dealing with the government agencies is still bureaucratic, but the attitude is fantastic. It's they want to say yes. You, that's right other places they want to they, they want to say, say no. no they want to pass the buck or yeah. whatever but no here they'll take you to the they'll they'll show you what you need to do and they'll help you get it done and it'll cost very little and everyone wants to help and the locals are so friendly the the attitude of the locals is just fantastic yeah. so hopefully we can we can keep that going and and life can continue to improve here definitely well we will have to uh, have you back on in a few months here to, to hear uh, how how your business is, is growing and what sure. other opportunities you see. But um, make sure people reach out to Owen and he will deliver you your uh, better beef. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great to talk.